Hi, my name is Manny Leva, and I'm here with my four American guests, Francesca, Asha, Kayla, and Anais. We are here at World by to discuss current events. To begin, Anais. So the story that I chose is a story about my home city that I'm native to, San Francisco. It was here in the, the I, Independent, and it talks about the recent mayoral election we had where London Breed was elected as our first black woman mayor of mm. San Francisco. The article portrayed London Breed as a very progressive woman, as her platform is very uh, part of the people. Her background is that she was raised by her grandmother in public housing, and she lived on food stamps and welfare for some time. So it seems like she would be a very down-to-earth person, and that she's very invested in helping people who grew up in the same situations as her. The sort of context of San Francisco politically is that it is a very progressive city, but it's this sort of... Uh, artificial liberalism, where people are more concerned with appearing very politically correct, progressive, and liberal, when that may not actually be the case. One of the big issues in San Francisco is housing. Mm. There is a huge disparity in wealth, and there is a tremendous amount of homeless people there. So everyone's concern is what new mayor and new politicians' plans are going to be to get homeless people off the street or help tenants' rights and make them prevent more evictions. as more and more wealthy techies come in to move into the city. And However, if you read London Breed's plans, they are not quite what she wants to portray herself as. She thinks that the power should be returned more to the people who are renting the homes. Her plans for homeless people is more to kind of shove them out of the way rather than really help them like get more housing. Of course, she's going to be continuing with gentrification. So while she would be an excellent role model, what does that matter if there's no more people for her to influence in the city, more people that look like her because they're getting kicked out and she doesn't seem to be doing anything to stop it. In San Francisco, the reason I think and many, many other people realize she got elected was because of, of the political beliefs of many people in the city where they just want to appear as though they're very progressive and very liberal. So when there is a candidate like her, who's a black woman, they're more concerned with voting for the black woman rather than voting for the person with the best policies for the city and what is best for the city. I think that personally, being someone of color and seeing someone of color in such a high position is very empowering, especially like to someone who, you know, you always think like, oh, I want to be a mayor, right? It's possible for me, when at a time that wasn't possible, you know? But you do have to consider the, the impact she could have, like her views, just because she's a black woman in power doesn't mean that she will like portray what people want from her. Do you think that because of her race that she's able to get away with a lot more? I think that definitely the general mentality of the city where people like are not doing the actual research to to these issues which they they say they care about yet when it comes down to it they just voted for someone who's going to continue pushing like making things worse, mm -hmm. you know, because they are more concerned with their appearance and they want to be like, I voted for the black woman because I'm not racist. And they constantly want approval from the few people of color left in the city as well. Kayla, what, uh, what do you have to put on the table today? So in the Daily Express, I found an article on a woman named Barbara Coombs. And so she has just recently confessed to having killed her own father. During that time, she's been taking his pension money and claiming that he's still alive and while he was buried in the garden. Her father was very abusive towards her and she was, she actually had PTSD and severe depressive disorder mm -hmm. and so she found a, um, a box full of child pornography and she snapped and hit the, her 87 year old father with a shovel and killed him. That was 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. So she recently came forward with this information that she had killed her father. And so she has been going through the court system. And so I think they were going to give her about nine years in jail for manslaughter. So do you know the location of this murder? Yeah, it was in Manchester. It was in Manchester? Yes. Would you say that Manchester is a dangerous area? Um, well, I've never been there, but, uh, I mean, every place has its dangers. You said that when she was younger, she was abused, am I correct? Yes. Do you say that she's justified in some way for the murder? For after all the abuse that he put her through? I mean, if you think about it, yes, killing somebody is very wrong, but in the sense that 
her father was an evil man, that he was abusive and was a pedophile, then, I mean, it could be if there were no laws. Morally, murder all around is, is, uh, is incorrect. However, the, due to the circumstances, would you say, like, to an extent, she's, like, morally defended? She's coming from a background which I can understand that she killed her father, but then again, I feel like nobody should kill anybody. Like, the murder isn't justified, but because of her background, you can see, like, the understanding of yeah. what, the, what came before it. Well, I think that's a pretty good point. Let's just, uh, we could just hope that justice prevails in this situation. Asha, what have you brought to the table today? So, I have an article by The Guardian, um, and it's entitled, Pop Protesters and Tight Security as Britain Prepares to Receive President Trump. And basically the background of the story is that President Trump is coming to visit Britain for four days. He's going on kind of like a European tour kind of thing. He's visiting France and Scotland as well. But we've acknowledged that the people of these European countries have been protesting, mm -hmm. which I find interesting considering they haven't protested any other U.S. president. And in relation to that, the politicians are kind of being in a neutral state, which I also find interesting because if your people seem to be so engrossed in this issue and they seem that they are very hesitant towards this new president, I feel I personally would react differently to someone of that nature because obviously they're coming from a certain state of mind where they feel as though he's not someone that they want to be in relation with. Mm -hmm. The mayor, actually, of London, Shadi Khan, he has permitted them to make a giant blimp of President Trump near Parliament as a, like a baby, a screaming baby, which Trump found to be a expression of freedom of speech, as he would call mm. it. So it's just been very interesting to see how people across all European countries are reacting to this. They are protesting. The police have been called off their leave to manage and control this issue as well. I think it's actually quite interesting the first thing you said, how we've never quite seen this with any other president before. When Obama separated kids and put them in cages as well, separated them from their families and dropped more bombs on the Middle East than any other president before, right? And so it's, it's interesting that tying into what I talked about specifically like in my home city of San Francisco and sort of the false progressivity of people when really they're more concerned with their progressive appearance rather than what they really care about, right? And it's interesting the role that the media plays into this because we obviously hear all about that Trump's doing and the way that all the horrible things he's doing, which are horrible, don't get me wrong, but he's not the first president to have done this. He certainly did not start this. Mm -hmm. Yet we're hearing about it all the way like in Britain. There's people protesting this president in Britain but we haven't seen it for other presidents in the past. So you're saying I, the media's exposure is what's making it a big deal now because they're getting more and more detail than they ever did before. I don't think that the media did quite as good of a job covering a lot of the, the you know, bad things that Obama did as well, the same things that Trump is doing, Obama did, and those weren't covered under Obama's term. Do you think it also be connected back to that, to that race thing, like we said from the mayor from San Francisco? Yeah, and people are concerned with appearing very mm. progressive and wanting to say like, oh, we love this president because he was black rather than really being concerned with what, okay, he's black, but what is he doing, right? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, a lot of the things he was doing is the same things that Trump is doing. I mean, in relation to what you're saying, I completely agree. Like, just because he's the first black president doesn't mean you, you can allow or disregard the things that he did also. I think being that Trump is so controversial, which also isn't the first time a president's been controversial, you know? He's been very, I think Trump is just very more open and he has access to more um, equipment, resources, for example, social media is a really big thing with Donald Trump. And that, I feel like that helps him, his opinion and his the way he displays himself to other countries, it's clearer. The communication is easier. People can see his tweets. People can see what he's actually doing and people can also see the Americans' reaction to him. I think in a very long time, we haven't had a president who's so openly opinionated. Those who are against him are very vocal. So I find that maybe it may just be the Western opinion just, just spreading to Europeans also. And I think also that we have to remember Trump is 
a, a figure in the media, right? Yes. Before he was ever a politician. He's more of a politics. celebrity. No, it was like the lights and the show, like everything he has to do to get he's that a sort of... Exactly, yeah. he's a character, right? And so it makes it very, very easy for the media to put him everywhere and make it entertaining for people, which is why you've got things like a baby blimp going up, right? Which, which turns things that are very, very serious into something comedic and endorsed by this president who knows that it's just sort of boosting this he character did, yeah. that he's built yeah. for himself, right? So do you think that the, that the British have like any, uh, any role in giving their opinions considering that it's, uh, it is the American president? I think they do. They're fully involved in their, I mean, their allies. We work closely together. Like they have an, they're being impacted in some way. This is someone who represents our country. Mm -hmm. So I think the entire world it has the right to speak up about it because Americans sure do have their opinions about other countries and how they run things. We very much do, and we try to act as though we're the central and everyone else is the outside. So if that is the case, if that's if you're going to believe that you're the central and everyone else is the outside, but you have Donald Trump being the leader who is very controversial, he's not. He appears to have a certain bias, and it's also difficult for him to communicate with other people. Like for example, his meeting with King Jong Un, he found him to be a very impressive man, and they got along very well. A dictator who kills his own people. You know what I mean? So it. it you have to understand that some we all judge each other. We all give each other feedback. All right, Francesca. Uh, well, I read an article in the Daily Telegraph today, and it was about India's government asking the country's top court to decide whether or not they should repeal or keep the law that criminalizes homosexual acts. Mm -hmm. And it's a law that makes gay sex punishable up to 10 years in prison. And they have gotten a lot of pushback on it. There has been some like protesting against it. However, while there is a degree of acceptance in the bigger cities, a large amount of the homosexuals in India do not reveal their sexuality. Do you think this has to do with like their culture or like their religion? I don't, because the main religion in India, which is Hindu, in their text it does not explicitly say like, man should not lie with man like it does in other religions like Catholicism. Mm -hmm. If you look at ancient Indian texts from before colonialism, before Western influence in India, for example, the Kama Sutra, there's an entire section dedicated to gay sex. And in several other different texts, there's, uh, for example, the Hijras, which is this idea of a third sex, are people who were very, very respected in India up until about the 18th century, which is when a lot of anti-LGBTQ sentiment came over, which is also when colonialism and the Western influence came over. Right. So it's interesting that now it seems to be the Western world that is once again putting a lot of pressure and looking down on countries like India where where gay sex is still illegal and things like that because those ideas originally came from the Western world. Do, do you think this is a neo-colonialism attitudes resurfacing? Yes, I do. It's just a bit hypocritical for the Western world to now be frowning upon them and, and putting like a bunch of like influence and looking down on countries like this for ideas that were placed by these Western people. I think that, you know, of course, gay sex should be legal. I think LGBTQ people should absolutely have their rights, but for the Western world and, you know, British newspapers and stuff to go about explaining that issue from a perspective that reinforces colonial attitudes isn't quite the right way to go about it. It's almost as if it has bias behind it without using bias itself. Because these huge roles, the gender fluid people are celebrated in India now. So I find that interesting that they're celebrated now, but we they weren't before, and then Western countries wanted to look down on them for how they behaved. Or before, when we weren't, we didn't agree, we would have looked down on them then. So why is it that we feel we have the call to make? How do you think we could address equality in India without seeming sort of condescending? I think I personally am like a huge believer in just understanding and seeing the history and understanding behind why things are the way they are, right? So you can't, uh, you can't just say like, oh, people in India are being oppressive towards the LGBT community and just kind of leave it as, oh, that's their problem, that's their fault, this is the way they are. And instead, in these articles, it should include a little bit of history, you know? Like, these sorts of attitudes toward gay people didn't exist up until the 18th century with colonialism. Mm -hmm. I think that it just has to start with accepting a little bit of responsibility, and that is not a negative thing at all. 
but it's the only way for it to be legitimate solidarity and not just a continuation of the supremacist views of we are looking down on you for this. I think that that we really need to just trust people in India because it, it takes time and they're capable of doing it, you know? Right, right. We have to trust their roots. Oh, yeah. We have to trust them. All right. So I just want to thank the audience for joining us in, the, in this discussion today. I want to thank my guests. You guys had amazing ideas. But we also want to hear what you guys have to think. So go ahead and write what you guys have to think in the comments below. And um, yeah, we'll see you guys next time.